Tanu Rabbanon. The Gemara in Masech the Yuma, the Aflamet Tesamet Beis, tells a story. Tanu Rabbanon, the rabbis taught. Shimon HaTzadik served in his tenure as the Kayin Gadol, as the high priest in the beginning of the second Beis Amikdash for four decades. The year that he passed away, says the Gemara, he came out after Yom Kippur from the Kaidr Shakadoshim and he told his students he's soon going to pass on. They said, How do you know? So Shimon Hatzadik said, Each year when I walk in on Yom Kippur to Kaidr Shakadoshim, I see an old man, Lavush Levenim, Va'atuf Levenim, dressed and bedecked in white. He walks in with me and he comes out with me. This year, on Yom Kippur, when I went into the Holy of Holies, I also saw an old man. But he was love of He was dressed in black. The Gemara says, indeed, after Sukkot, Shimon HaTzadik fell ill, and a week later he passed on. I ask you, my dear friends, what's the meaning of the story? He saw a man in Kaidah Shakadoshim, dressed in white, dressed in black. The Pasuk says, No person should be there, even outside of Kaida Shakadash. The Yerushalmi says on this Pasuk, Even the angels were not allowed to be present when the Kohen Gadol did the Avoid. And suddenly here, a Gemara says, he walks in and he sees a man dressed in black, dressed in white, and it's predicting his death. What is the meaning of the story? So when I asked my dear friend, Rabbi Schwartz, why he created Legadel, he didn't have enough headaches with the catering business, with Jews complaining that the food was not hot enough, not cold enough, too little, too much. Some Jews complain it's too much. I'd be complaining. I couldn't digest. I got sick, whatever it is. He needed the burden of Legadel. So he gave me an answer, a very deep and meaningful answer. But I'm going to summarize his answer through an anecdote. In Borough Park, which has a couple of Jews there, real estate is very, very tight. So this fellow needed a dirre, needed a home for himself, his mishpacha. And he sees a sign on 13th Avenue in Borough Park, a house for rent, one floor, top floor, but one condition, a family with no children. He goes in for an interview. An elderly couple, and they tell them, listen, we love children, but we're elderly. We go to sleep 8.30 p.m. 9 o'clock is lights out, and 9.05 we're sleeping after Hamapal. We simply cannot have children dancing on our heads. We can't deal with it anymore. We're past that age. So therefore, we're asking for a couple without children or with adults. The younger man looks at him and says, I'm the right guy for you. No problem. They sign a lease, eight years. Moves in. The man and his wife, the elderly couple, go to sleep. It's 8.30 at night, and suddenly they hear celebidic, lustic und freilich. It's quite exciting on the second floor. There's jumping and dancing. It sounds like Purim and some chastair hakafas. The furniture is being transported, being moved. It's Sukkot and Purim together with Pesach, Kainos, Hillel. It's wonderful with Kaparis. He goes running up after two hours, 11 o'clock. He goes running up. He sees Kenai and Haram, family of 14 kids. Jumping all over the place. Turning over the beds, the bookcases. Terrorizing the entire apartment. The old man looks at this renter and his tenant. And he says, Lomari Misani, why did you deceive me? Why did you not lie to me? He says, I never lied to you. He said, we made up that it should be a mishpacha without kinder. A mishpacha with no kinder. He said, these are kinder? These are not kinder, those are chayas. <laughs> they're not children. He says, they're animals. I don't call them kinder. <laughs> Why do I share this anecdote with you? Some of us grew up and we heard that title or a similar title conferred either upon ourselves or upon our siblings or upon our friends. 
I once had a teacher, God bless him, we were little kids, and he turned to us and he said, I'm greater than the Maral of Prague. Maral of Prague had one golem. I have 29 golems in my classroom, and I'm much greater than him, because the Maral's golem couldn't talk. And my golems all have verbal prowess. They all know how to articulate themselves. So you can imagine the great feeling of self-confidence that many of us came home with. And sometimes it translates and projects itself for years. I was the, some time ago at a bar mitzvah. I'm dancing in the circle and the Avi Ben, the father of the bar mitzvah boy, invites me to come dance with him in the, on the dance floor in the center of the dance floor. So I come and we're holding hands and we're dancing. And I take a look at the father and he's crying. He's sobbing. I naturally thought it's tears of joy at the bar mitzvah of his oldest boy. But as he's sobbing, he turns to me and he says, did anything come out of me? Did my life amount to anything? I look at him and I say, is this the question you're pondering tonight? Celebrating the bar mitzvah of your boy? You have a beautiful family. You have five wonderful children. You have an extraordinary wife. You're a successful man. Why do you ask that question? We were classmates in Cheder, in Yeshiva. And he says, because Ploini ben Ploini, who let's put him, let's say he wasn't the most skilled at pedagogical sensitivity, to put it mildly, came over to me in Yeshiva and told me one day, he says, you're wasting your time here. Nothing will ever come of you. Nothing. Leave. He told this to me twice, one year and then the next year. I look at my classmate. And I say, this happened 34 years ago. 34 years ago. He looked at me and he said, but not one day passes that I don't think about what this man told me. You, Rabbi Jacobson, tell me tonight, was he right or was he wrong? Did anything come of me? Was he mistaken or was he correct in his description of me? And I remembered, once heard from my Rebbe, the genesis of Golos happens when? When the Jewish people leave Eretz Yisrael and make their first descent to the first exile of Jewish history, the Egyptian exile, Golos Mitzrayim. But how did that happen? Answer, Yosef was sold to the Egyptians. But how did that happen? We all know, his brothers. But that wasn't the plan. The plan was Reuven schemed and devised a strategy that they would throw him into the pit. Why? He wanted to come and retrieve him and take him back to his father, to Yaakov. And then they sat down. They put him into the pit. They sat down to eat. In the meantime, the caravan came. They sold their brother to the Egyptians. The Pasuk says, Vayoshev Reuven alaboy. Reuven returns to the pit. And he sees the lad is gone. He rents his clothes. And the question is, where were you, Reuven? The boy was in the pit. Why weren't you there? The answer is, they sat down to eat bread. That's the hint. Rashi picks up on that hint. He says, obviously, Reuven was fasting. So he couldn't eat. So what do you do if everybody is eating and you're fasting? You go do something else. So he was gone. He wasn't there. But why was he fasting? So Rashi gives us his interpretation. One of the interpretations is, Al Shabil Bail Yitzue Aviv, Asukoya Besaki Batanis. He was wearing a sack, a sackcloth, and he was fasting to rectify the fact that he interfered in the intimate life of his father. How long ago did that happen? When Rachel passed away. Yosef was now nine years old. That happened nine years ago. Reuven was fasting for nine years. Maybe on a daily basis. Certainly Bahab. Today. <laughs> for those who fasted. He was fasting for nine years. Maybe daily, maybe weekly. To rectify what he tried to do to protect the honor of his mother. Leah. This was Reuven. That's why he was not present when Yosef was sold. Because he was busy learning, davening, doing tshuva doing meditation in a private relationship with Hashem to fix his neshama. Now let's think about this on a deeper level. 
Because of that, Yosef was sold to the Egyptians. Because of that, Golos began. In other words, the genesis of Golos doesn't begin from bad people doing bad things. The genesis of Golos sometimes originates in the fact that holy people are doing holy things. But the question is, how can you be engaged and immersed in your own fast and in your own tshuva and in your own spiritual perfection when you know that there's a Jewish child languishing in the abyss? When you know that there's a Jewish child in a pit, mentally, physically, emotionally, psychologically, or spiritually, how can I go to my spiritual cocoon and dedicate time and resources to rectify myself, to become the Adam HaSholem, to become that great, unique person without a blemish, without any spiritual filth whatsoever when I know that my brother is languishing in a pit. That apathy that comes from righteousness and holiness is the beginning of Golos. When we don't feel that connection, when we don't feel that responsibility, we don't feel that duty. My dear friends, I always wondered, what does the word ish mean? A man, everybody knows. Be a man. An ish is a man. But Rashi seems to give us a split or paradoxical interpretation. One parsha away from another parsha. Where? Yaakov Avinu is struggling one night. Vayivaser Yaakov levade vayayavik. Ish imoy, a man wrestles with him. Who? Dr. Ashi. Sarai shall Esav. Esav's angel. One week later, Vayeshev, Yosef is going to look for his brothers. He gets lost. Vayimtza ehu ish. A man finds him and says, Matevakish, what do you search for? He says, I'm looking for my brothers. The man says, they went to Dois. And Rashi says, who's the Ish? You remember? Malach Kavriel. What's the schizophrenia here? In Vayishlach Ish is Esau's angel. The next week, Ish became Malach Kavriel. How did that happen? How did this Ish evolve so fast? Even according to Darwin, it took a few million years. From Ace of the Gavriel in one parsha. The answer, of course, is depends on context. Yaakov is alone in the middle of the night. Yosef is alone, lost in the wilderness. Both are stranded, alone, solitary, without direction. And both are met by two men. But the two men respond in different ways. In Vayishlach, the man looks at Yaakov and says, Ah! He's vulnerable. He's alone. There's nobody to have his back. I'll pounce on him. ish ima. He wrestles him till dawn break and tries to kill him. That's one type of man. By Yosef, what happens? A man looks at a vulnerable child who's lost and he says, Motivakesh, what are you searching for? Maybe I can help you find it. Rashi says, this is Gavriel. For how many decades did some of our best, most sensitive, brightest, deepest children languish in a pit? And often there was the person, the predator, who recognized vulnerability and in the good tradition of Esau, Vaye Avek, make the boy limp, physically or even worse, emotionally. Entered Lagadale and said, we will not go fast and create a generation of giants when there are children languishing in a pit. And when a boy is lost, the Ish, who is Gavriel, comes and says, Motivakish. You're searching for something. What? And every child will tell you, consciously or unconsciously, as Achai Anoichimavakish. I'm looking for my brothers. And remember what the Chsam Soifer says in a eulogy he gave for France, for the, for the emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the early 1800s, printed in Drush's Chsam Soifer. Chsam Soifer says something fascinating. He says there's four times, at least it says in Chumash, to take a person. Shem tells Moshe, Kachas Aaron, take Aaron. He tells Moshe, Kachas Yeshua, take us Yeshua. 
So Rashi says each time when it says take a person, what does Rashi say? How do you take a person? Bidvarim, through words. Enki chela bidvarim, through words. Ask the Chassam Sefer, how did Rashi know? Maybe kachas Yeshua means take him. <laughs> take him by his lapel. Nobody ever took you. You take somebody, you schlep them. How do you know it means through words? Take means take. Go over and take him. Moshe was a strong fellow. How does Rashi know it's through words? And Chassam Sefer answers, this is what he says. He says, if a person was only a body, then... You can take them physically. But since a person is made up of a mind, a soul, a personality, and a body, he says if you take a child or you take any person physically, you did not take the person. You may be stronger than them and you've taken their flesh, but you didn't take the person. Imagine, you want to go to shul on Shabbos and of course you want your child to come with you to shul. Yankee! Time to go to shul. It's nine o'clock. It's time to go to shul. Yankee says, Ich will nicht. I don't want to go. Yankee, we're going to shul. I don't want to go to shul. I'm going to take you to shul. And you take Yankee to shul. And you are certain that you're a good father. You took your child to shul. You didn't take your child to shul. You took their flesh to shul. You took their arms to shul. You took their legs to shul. You didn't take your child to shul. Your child wasn't in shul. And the Soifer adds, and when you take a person that way, it's actually you brought them further away from there. Because you inspired in them a sense of rebellion. I hate this place. I'm here, but I don't want to be here. He says there's only one way of taking a person. Words, inspiration. To be able to take you I need to reach into you. I have to speak to your soul. I have to speak to your mind. That's education. Discipline is sometimes necessary as a tool, as a means. But education begins with communication, with inspiration. But sometimes we looked at those children and we're like, you remember? Trach, boom, trach. What about this one? Anybody got this? You ever got this? When I was a kid, we had a teacher. He would have you put your fingers together. Anybody was like to this in Britain? The queen, yeah? You ever had the queen do this, discipline you? And he would, with a stick, he would go like this. And he was convinced that he's educating a new generation of children. Sometimes that's not how you take a person. That's not how you take a person. You're dealing with a person. You're not dealing with a robot. You're not dealing with a bottle of seltzer. You're not dealing with a piece of sushi. A piece of sushi you take with your hands. I'm sorry, with your chopsticks. It's Britain. I'm from New York. But a person you can't take with chopsticks. <laughs> Nor can you take with your hands. Everybody knows there's that powerful niggin that made it into the Jewish world in the last few years. That our holy mothers, many of our holy mothers pray during candle lighting. When they pray for their families and their loved ones. I don't know who authored the tefillah. But obviously, obviously he was a Kabbalist. And had profound, had a profound insight in each word. Because I see that it's set up according to the ten spheres. Chachma, Bina, Das, Chesed, Gvura, Tif, Eres, Netzach, Choy, Yisoyed, Malchus, from Sefer Yitzira, from Zohar, Chachamim, Unavoinim, Oya, Ve, Hashem, is Ava, and then he goes to Yira, and then he goes to Emes, which is Tif, Eres, Zera, Kodesh, Dveikim, Bashem, Dveikim, and then he continues with Yisoyed and Malchus, and he says, I pray that they will light up the world, Batoira, Ubemasim, Toivim, did you ever think about those words? What is he saying? He's telling us something that we often lose sight of. We sometimes create a cookie cutter model that every child or youngster has to fit into. And if you don't fit into that cookie cutter model, you're considered a failure. But that's not what this tefillah is telling the Rebbeinu Shalom. There are those who will light up the world, Betoira. 
There are those who will light up the world with Maisim Toivim. They also have Torah. But their unique talent is Maisim Toivim. And then there are those who will illuminate the world. Bechol Meleches Avoides Aboire. The Heleke Baal Shem Tov once said, the Gemara says, it brachas. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Mishacharav HaKadosh Baruch Hu Ba'elamai. Ein loy la kodesh baruch hu ba elam mishacharav mishacharav beis hamikdash. Ein loy la kodesh baruch hu ba elam el adalat amas shel alochah bilvat. When the beis hamikdash was destroyed, Hashem has in His world only four cubits of alocha. Asked the Baal Shem Tov, what about Hashem who will lekim ein oid mulvadai? Bashamayim imal al aritz mitochas. What about kol maasachel l'shem shemayim bechol derechecha deyu? What do you mean ein loy ba elam el adalat amas shel alochah bilvat? If I'm outside the adalat amas shel alochah, there's no hashgacha. God is not there chalila. What happened to the song? Hashem is here. Hashem is there. Answer the Baal Shem Tev. We read the Gemara wrongly. Homiletically, of course. He said the meaning of the Gemara is Meshachara of Beis HaMikdash. Part of the symptom of Churban Beis HaMikdash is that one thinks Part of the Churban Beis HaMikdash is that a person thinks that the only place where you could find Hashem is in Dalet Amash Shalalacha. And a child who may not be able to achieve the Dalai Lama Shalach in the most perfected manner. In the most perfected manner, sometimes he's excluded from the eternal dignity of being part of Knesset Yisrael. But the whole function of Dalai Lama Shalach is to teach that Halacha permeates the world. Istakal Baraisa Bara Alma Torah penetrates the whole world. There's not a nook and a cranny of existence that is devoid from the divine unity, from the divine presence. We said in Perkyavis Amar Rabbi Yaakov, you're taking a hike and you're learning. You're doing a shear. You're discussing a sugi and gemara. You're discussing a toisvus, a rajba, a ran, a bakiv eger, a pischei tshuva, a birei agra, a bircha shmuel, or a chidushe agramat. You're schmoozing and learning. And suddenly you see a beautiful landscape and you see what a beautiful tree. And you stop learning and you say, wow! What a beautiful tree. You're endangering your life. Rabbi say, what did David HaMelech do in Tehillim? Baruch Hinafshi, Marabu Masech, Akula Bechach Masisa. There's blessings that Chazal made for nature. You're endangering your life. The Pshat is, the Mishnah says, you're learning. You interrupt your learning and you say how beautiful this tree is. In other words, in your mind, the celebration of nature is an interruption of Torah. For you, Torah and existence are two realms. Hashemayim, Shemayim, Lashem, and earth is divorced of that. But the Kotzke said, that they should make from Eretz Shemayim. Why are you interrupting your learning to celebrate the beauty of nature? It's one Rebbeinu Shalaylam, it's one world. So each child is an indispensable note in the divine symphony. Come, Chavar, let's hear the niggin. Let's hear the niggin. I'll continue after. We'll sing the niggin. And I want to pay tribute during this melody to all your children and to all those children. Not only the children that Legadal takes care of, but to all those children that you have, and to all of our children, start, start, to all of our children who light up the world and will light up the world with Torah, with Maisim Toivim, Oh, 
person sends me the story on the email I get the story touched me very deeply there was this boy who was drafted in America to the Vietnam War the Vietnam War was long and bloody and violent it cost many a casualty he calls up his father his father lived in California and he tells his father I made it I'm back in the States, I'm free, I'm coming home on Monday. This was Friday, I'm coming home to your home, San Francisco, on Monday. His father couldn't believe it. He and his mother, his wife were overjoyed, screaming from happiness. Their son has made it, coming home. The boy says, Dad, Dad, I just have one thing I want to share with you. In my platoon, I became a best friend to somebody who accompanied me everywhere through the thicket of battle. And he stepped on a mine. He lost both, both of his legs and he lost an arm. He has no family, he has nobody. And we became so close. I wanna bring him home. I'll be able to take care of him, I'll be able to nurture him. He needs the warmth of a home. And I trust you, I tell you Tati, Daddy, you will love him. His personality is something extraordinary. His father says, son, I understand, but really, our home is not made for such a boy. He served the country. The government will take responsibility for him. They will put him in the home that he needs to be. They will take care of him. You could go visit him. But this house is not a place for him. He says, daddy, I promise you that you and mom will fall in love with this kid. He says, listen, I'll be honest with you. We're going to be nice to this kid externally, not to hurt your feelings. Deep down, we're going to resent him every day he's in our house. He's going to burden our life. He's going to make us miserable. He's going to take away our serenity. We're going to have to look after him and take care of him. And inside, we're going to resent him very badly. Let's not start that relationship. Find another home for him. The son said, okay, I understand. And he said, goodbye. Sunday night, the father gets a call from the police. A boy, a young soldier who came back from Vietnam, took his life over the weekend. Jumped off a roof. He's in the morgue. They need somebody to identify him. It looks like he's family. His father comes to the morgue, takes a look. He sees the face of his boy. And he also sees that everything his boy described about his best friend, he was really describing himself. It was him. It was not his best friend. I read this. Never, ever do I judge people. I've seen enough and heard enough never to judge anybody. And the Svasemis adds three words. You will never be in anybody's shoes. But it taught me such a powerful lesson. Are we ready to accept our children for who they are? Or for who we want them to be? For who we expected them to be? For who we hoped they were? Love, Nietzsche said, by most people is we don't love other people. We love our version of them. 
Do you love your child or do you love your version of your child? And if your child somehow doesn't fit into that version, uh, the relationship changes. I'm really not judging anybody because this can be painful. Certain people have expectations of who their child is and will be and must be, just like your father and mother had about you. And when things turn out differently, according to Ratzon Haboyri, we are so disappointed we sometimes let it out on the child. I want to tell you something, my dear friends. I was invited a little while ago to speak at a conference of 80 organizations in America that deal with children at risk and crisis. So Ness, 80 organizations, Jewish organizations together in a room. But the food always brings Jews together. So Baruch Hashem. That's the secret to achtos. People say, achtos, achtos. I say, you have good food, you'll have achtos. It's not so complicated. Men have to be fed and watered. Sachat. Anyway, so I'm, I'm giving a speech there after breakfast. Of course, everybody ate cheese danishes, a healthy breakfast, and then I spoke. I finished speaking. Ayid comes over to me. We're sitting at the first table. So, said, Jason, I want to share with you a story, not Clay Shaney, Clay Rish, and it happened to me. This was a Jew. His name is Dr. David Palkowitz. He's a professor of psychology in Yeshiva University. And he's a therapist for, I think, 35 or 40 years. He tells me, he says, I want to tell you a story that happened to me. One day, a 15-year-old yeshiva boy from Brooklyn comes to see me. What's going on, I say? He says, I'll tell you. I have a mishpacha, a family. Extremely successful in the world of Torah. Each one of my brother graduated the top yeshivas with honors, continue to learn and steig away and succeed in Torah. My sisters, extraordinary girls, married wonderful husbands, serious B'nai Torah. And I, I'm the black sheep in the family. I'm 15 years old, I've already been to nine yeshivas. I've been around the block. My father decided I need therapy. Dr. Pelkowitz tells me, he says, Rabbi Jacobson, you know sometimes a person comes into your office and you just, even before talking to them, you know that you love this person. He said, I just love this kid. He was so full, yet such spunk, such energy, such intelligence. I'm thinking to myself, probably the white, white sheep of the family. I look at him, and I'm like, I don't see a real problem here. You know what we're going to do? Next week, ask your whole family to come into therapy. Your father, your mother, all your siblings, and if you have grandparents, bring them in. I look at Palkowitz, I talk to Palkowitz, with all due respect, you're now bringing Zaydas and Bubbas into therapy? Survivors of the Holocaust into therapy? Sure. Ask a 90-year-old grandmother, so what are your feelings about your mother? They were lucky if they had a mother, for heaven's sake. They were lucky if they had a meal. Nobody had the time and the luxury to feel emotions. I'm confident, I'm not confident, I'm a loser, I'm a semi-loser, I'm going to be a loser, I'm almost depressed. I hate my sister, I love my brother, my father was this, my father was that. Most of them didn't even have fathers. He says, you're right. But in this instance, I felt that the grandparents have to be there. I say, why? Where's the clinical professionalism here? Why are you bringing in the grandparents? What are they? He says, I don't know, you're right. I just had a feeling. Okay. He tells me next week, into the office, come Tati and Mommy, brothers and sisters, big family, can I inherit? And the father had parents, elderly couple, a Zayda and a Baba, who walked into the office and sat down. Dr. Palkowitz turns to the father and he says, you suggested your son comes to therapy. Perhaps you speak first. Tell us what's the issue. The father gets up and he says, I'm brokenhearted. Look at my ingalach here, Kenai and Hara. He graduated this yeshiva, this yeshiva. He finished Daf Yomi three times. He's about to finish Daf Yomi seven times. He gives a Shia Daf Yomi four and a half times a day. He davens nets, he finished Mishnah Brura, he already knows half Shaz Balpeh. This one founded Hatzola, this one is the greatest Askin in Borough Park, this is the greatest Askin in Flatbush, this is the future Abed Shal Kol Bnei And this one is unbelievable, this is Ashas Yid. This is, this is blessed, and look at my girls, ah, and their husbands, and he starts rattling off the yichis of all of his sons-in-law. And he says, and then I have this one boy who has so much potential, he's bright and good and interesting. I said, tell him, why are you wasting your time? You're just wasting your time. One yeshiva to another yeshiva, like a ping pong. Like a ping pong. Boom, 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 boom. Stay in one place. Dedicate yourself. You're wasting your life. And it hurts me, not only for our sake, for his sake. And I thought he should go to therapy. The father is quiet. There's silence in the room. 
who gets up to speak? Somebody who doesn't follow protocol in offices of therapists, namely the Zaid. The Zaid is an old man. He gets up and he says, I want to say a few words. Okay, sure, go ahead. Go ahead. The man says, all of you know that I'm a very rich man. I have a successful business. But after what I heard now from my son, I want to erase him from my will. Okay. For that, he wanted to say, you need a lawyer's office, not a therapist's office. What happened? He looks at his son and he says, have you forgotten the story I told you when you were a child? Did you not share this with my Enochlach, with my grandchildren? And he looks at all of his grandchildren and he says, so let me tell you something about your grandfather. I grew up in Poland. We had a beautiful family and a large family. And guess what? All my brothers were sitting in yeshiva and steiging away and learning. And the family had one black sheep. You know who? Me. Before they had the diagnosis, I was ADD. I was ADHD with all the hidurim. Every possible diagnosis of somebody who can't be present, they say the acronym of ADHD is attention deficit, hey donuts. <laughs> I was that person. I could not sit still. I couldn't read, I couldn't listen, I couldn't follow sentences, I couldn't concentrate. So I was out in the street, but I was savvy. I was street smart, I was clever, I was shrewd, and I was savvy. And my father had tremendous, tremendous agmas nefesh, agony for me. And one day in 1938, I picked up a book. And the title of the book was Mein Kampf, authored by Adolf Hitler, Yemach Shemoy. And I read Mein Kampf. And I came home and I said, Tata, Germany and Poland share a border. This man is serious. Every Jew is going to be wiped out. We must escape before it's too late. My father looked at me and said, Heruf Reden Narishkeit. Stop speaking rubbish. You know why you speak like this? Because you're not in yeshiva. <laughs> if you would be in yeshiva like your brothers, you would be sitting and learning and you wouldn't fill your cup, your head, with shtusim and narishkeit and such stupid books of some crazy anti-Semite. I said, Father, Perhaps I should be sitting and learning, but crazy I'm not, and I am clever and savvy, and I tell you, I feel it in my gut that this man is serious. He's going to act on his conviction, and we must pick ourselves up before it's too late and flee. My father chastised me and told me my words were ludicrous. I told my father painfully, if so, I will have to run away alone. I said goodbye to my father. I said goodbye to my mother. I left Poland. I crossed the ocean. I'm the only survivor of my entire family. He pointed to his grandson and he says, look at me. The reason this family is existing today is because there was one brother like me, different, out there, different personality. I was not capable of what my other brothers were capable, but that's why we're here today. That's why you're learning. You see this grandson? He is a carbon copy of his grandfather. He is me. Don't you dare denigrate this boy. Don't you dare put down this boy. Don't you dare make this boy feel unworthy, worthless, less worthy. Because the only reason you are all here studying Torah today, day and night, is because of a boy like him. Dr. Pelkowitz was silent. I say, Dr. Pelkowitz, you can't leave me stranded. What's the end of the story? I say, now, what happened now? What is happening now? He says, now, shortly after, his grandfather took him in to run the business. He says, today, this boy, this grandson, who was 15 at the time, he runs the whole business, and all of his brothers work for him. <laughs> he, supports, he supports each and every one of them. And then I understood the story of Shimon Atzadik. You remember the story of Shimon Atzadik? Come back with me to the story. That's the story. 
Shimon HaTzadik was the Kohen Gadol. He was the Rebbe of Klal Yisrael. Yoyru Mishpatecha Le'yakov Asher Aschel Yisrael. And Shimon HaTzadik lived in a difficult era because Alexander the Great was taking over the world. Hellenism was becoming the new culture of civilization. Alexander the Great conquered Judea. He wanted his statue in the Beis HaMikdash. Shimon HaTzadik, if I could quote him, said, it's not dark yet, but it's getting there. Shimon Atali did not know if there's going to be a future after his own demise. But every Yom Kippur, he found comfort and hope. You know why? Because we, when he went into the Kodesh HaKadoshim, representing the Kodesh HaKadoshim and every Jew, when he went into the Yechidosh HaBenefesh, to the Pintel Yid, to the Kodesh HaKadoshim of a Yiddish and Neshama, on Yom Kippur, on the holiest day of the year, the holiest man of the generation went into the holiest place. And you know what he saw? He saw an old man, Ruach Yisrael Sava. He saw the history of Klal Yisrael, the old man, and it was white. He saw the whiteness in every Jew. He saw the whiteness in every child. And he came out of the Kodesh HaKadoshim, rejuvenated, reinvigorated, full of hope, luminescence, and bright for a lichtike, for a white future. He says, this Yom Kippur, I walked into the Kodesh HaKadoshim. And you know what I saw? I saw the old man was dressed in black. I saw darkness awaiting us. And you know what I learned from this? I'm going to pass away this year. Why? Why? The answer is this. Because a teacher, a Rebbe, a Manhig, a Koyen Gadol, who looks at the youth and all he can see is blackness, darkness, he is not in a position where he is capable of serving as a leader, as a teacher, as a Rebbe, as a Manig Yisrael, in order to be able to lead your children, to lead your students, to lead your families, to lead your communities. You have to be able to look at every child and see the whiteness, see the potentiality, see the grace, see the promise, see the bright luminescent future. For me to be a Kohen Gadol among the Jewish people, I have to go into the Holy of Holies and see a bright nation and bright children. And if all I could see is blackness and doomness, it means it's time for me to vacate my seat and give the seat to somebody else. We'll be able to see in those children a different level of brightness. My brother shares with me. He gives a sheer class every week, Wednesday night in Manhattan many decades, mostly secular Jews. Some time ago, a man walks into the class, sits down. My brother sees immediately that his motor skills are compromised. When he opens his mouth, he notices that he has a serious speech impediment. He then notices that it's hard for him to function independently. And when they have a chat, the man shares with him, a devastating story. He was born with a neurological disease. The doctors told his parents in the hospital that he will never be able to function independently normally. And they said, if that's the case, we don't know what we're going to do because they were wealthy Manhattan Jews, social butterflies. They were always going from one reception to another reception to another dinner. You know, they were that type of activists. They were always going to events in this hotel, that hotel. And to have a disabled child... A handicap, a crippled child was not part of their plan. wasn't the game plan. So the doctor said, if so, you should give up the child. And they put the child into an institution from birth, and they never met him again. And the boy tells my brother, he's 30 years old, he never ever saw his father and mother, although they both live in Manhattan. Every month, his father sends him a very handsome check. So he has all of his needs met. He has some jobs to keep him busy. He's taken care of in the institution, but he never met his parents. They never wanted to create the emotional bond. My brother felt broken from the story. He took a telephone, unconventionally. He called up the father, and he says, I know this is not a usual telephone call. I've met your son. I want to tell you a soul so spiritual and sensitive, I have not met in my life. Physically handicapped, serious limitations and impediments, but it will be a privilege to meet him. 
And a second later, my brother hears, trach, boom. He hoped it was the operator. He phones back. The man says, you didn't get the message? Mix out of my life. Boom. What do you do? It was hard enough to make the call. You know, the butterflies in the heart, in the stomach when you got to make such a call. And now, the man hang up, hung up on them. He waited a few months. And he called the mother. Ayyidah Shamama is Ayyidah Shamama. And he introduces himself and he says why he's calling. I think you should meet your son. She starts crying. And she said, we're not about to revisit a decision we made 30 years ago. Leave it alone. My brother starts reasoning with her. He says this. He says, I really can't understand you. There are children who are orphans. They never had a father or a mother. Or one died young. Or both died. And their whole life, they wonder, what would have it been like to have my father or mother? Who was my father and mother? Anybody they meet who says, I knew your mother, I knew your father, they tell me, tell me about him. Show me a picture. Tell me about his personality. Their whole life they wonder about their parents. Children who were adopted sometimes search for their entire life to meet their biological parents, to find out the secret of their own shalshelas, their own existence, their own dynasty. Here, your son has two parents alive 10 minutes away in Manhattan, in the city of New York. How can you deprive your child from knowing and meeting his parents once in his life? What is he asking for? He's not asking to move into your home. He's not asking for you to move into his home. He's not asking for extra support. He wants to meet his parents. Why not? She says, you got to talk to my husband. The next week he calls the husband and he makes the same case. I have to give my brother credit, he was persistent. And the man says, let me think about it. Well, a week later, okay, we'll see him if you come along. I guess he wanted a buffer zone for some, you know, protection. The next Sunday, my brother and this boy come to their penthouse looking over Central Park in New York City in Manhattan. My brother tells me it was beyond stunning. This guy was obviously quite affluent and well-to-do. They walk into this penthouse. It's huge, a beautiful, stunning view of the skyline of New York City. Nobody's eyes meet each other. Nobody. They sit down at the table. There's some pieces of chocolate and candies on the table. And what do you talk Sunday afternoon when you meet somebody? You talk about the weather. Right? I know today's weather in London was something I brought from New York. You talk about the weather. By us, you talk Sunday afternoon, you talk about Trump, you talk about Hillary, you talk about Sanders, you talk about Obama if you're really bored. <laughs> it's Sunday afternoon, you do some Sunday football, whatever Minig America is. I'm sure Britain has its own Sunday afternoon conversations. Halach Lakarta al bin Musa. So that's what they're talking about. For 10 minutes, they're talking about the weather. My brother stops the conversation. He says, listen, we could talk about the weather for a long time now. We're not here for that. And he breaks the silence and cuts the tension a little bit and says, here's the deal. The reason we're here is I have met your son some time ago. I felt that he is such a profound human being, such a worked out soul, such a deep thinker. And I thought it would be a privilege for his parents to see who their boy is and for the boy to meet his parents. That's why we're here. Silence. The boy opens up his mouth first and he looks at his father and mother and I quote him verbatim the way my brother told me. The boy says these words. He couldn't say a patach. So he couldn't say daddy or mommy or papa or mama. He can only say a kametz. So he says papa, mama instead of pop, mom. Papa, mama. And these are his words. Papa, mama. I am not perfect, as you know. I have not been perfect from birth, as you know. But so are you. Papa and mama, you're also not perfect. I have forgiven you for your imperfections. I hope one day you will be able to forgive me 
for my imperfections. I have forgiven you for being imperfect. I hope one day you'll forgive me for being imperfect. Quiet. The mother broke down sobbing. She went over to her son and embraced him for like 10 minutes. The father followed suit. My brother told me at that moment I felt like a shatchen after the chuppah. You did your job. Now it's time to say baruch shepatrani on yourself and leave. Shatchen goes out with a paycheck. I'm not sure my brother went home with a paycheck. But he excused himself and he says, I think it's time for me to leave. And the family was reunited that day. And I thought to myself, let's be honest. Have you forgiven your children for their imperfections? Have you forgiven yourself for your imperfections? Can we forgive our loved ones for being imperfect? Can we embrace who they really are, not who we thought they're going to be? Can we make space for what Hashem wants from them, not necessarily what we want from them? Can we appreciate the fact that they illuminate the world and what is not included in kol meleches avoides haboire? Every moment, every act could become part of avoides haboire by revealing shahak kol niyo bidvoroi in every nakuda of life. Can I embrace my child for real, or can I only embrace my version of my child? Shimon Hatzadik says, if you want to be a kohen gadol. You want to be a Rebbe, a Rosh Hashiva, a Mashpia, a Mashgiach, a father, a mother, a teacher, a Rebbe, a Mechanech, a therapist, a Manhig on, every le on any level and who is not a leader on some level. I have to be able to look at every child and see them in the Holy of Holies. Lavush Levenim, Va'otov Levenim. That is why I and we I think are moved tonight to be here to celebrate the vision of that mission statement articulated in that one word, Vizakeni Legadel. Legadel! I don't know when you came up with this word if you had my whole drosha as a kavona. But Legadel, to raise. To raise what? To raise what? To raise the diamond that the Rebbeinu Shalolam entrusted into my hands to polish and to bring out its true and authentic beauty. To raise that child who's dedicated to truth, dedicated to love, dedicated to Dveikim, Bashem Dveikim, and will light up the world. That commitment that Legadol made when it opened up just a few short years ago. That never ever will there be left one child in Great Britain who will be languishing in a pit, sitting in the classroom day in, day out, feeling like a loser, feeling hopeless, feeling worthless, feeling denigrated and feeling looked down at. Not because there's something lowly about them, but because we did not have the mental space or the skill or the time or the resources or the understanding and sensitivity to be able to tune into the unique destiny, journey, mission, and shlichus of this boy, of this girl, of this diamond. That mission statement is one of the great incredible callings of our day as we strive to create and raise a new generation of ru'ugi dulim shegidalti those that Legado will be able to point at as it points already. On hundreds Yiddish kinderlach hara. Hundreds and soon will be thousands of Jewish children. Whose self-esteem, whose self-confidence, whose simchas hachayim, and therefore dveikus in Hashem, dveikus in truth, dveikus in Torah, dveikus in maisim toivim, is enriched, is enhanced. Not only enriched, it exists. At last, we say on Purim, Vegam Charvoina, Zochur Latoiv. We remember Charvoina. Charvoina, who's Charvoina? He gave advice. He said, Haman belongs on that tree. It's a good Shidduch. They once asked uh, Schwarzkopf, he was the commander in chief of the first Gulf War of Bush the father, 1991. 
So Schwarzkopf, he commanded the American troops then in the first Gulf War. So they once asked him, what's your perspective? Should we forgive terrorists? Should we forgive terrorists? He said, the job to forgive terrorists is God's job. It's his job. Our job is to arrange the meeting. <laughs> That's our job. And then God will forgive them. This is called a gleiche goyish cup. Because a yiddish cup would already be too complicated for this. I always say the definition of a Jew is he makes a fist, and the next step is ashamnu, bagadnu, gazalnu, alchet, shechatonu, alchet. Begam charvoin. I want to mention a charvoin in our times. An Italian Gentile whose name was Arturo Toscanini. One of the greatest conductors. Brilliant man, eccentric, naturally. Brilliant. Photographic memory, goinus in music. Why do I say Zochel Atoyev? Because Hitler fired almost every musician from Berlin and Germany when he came to power in the 1930s. And Toscanini put his name and created what was called the Palestine Philharmonic Orchestra. Hired most of the Jewish musicians from Germany, had them and their families make Aliyah, which literally saved them from death and gave them a place of dignity in the new land. He died in 1959, Toscanini, and Jews should remember him. And he hated Mussolini with a passion like he hated Hitler with a passion. And as a result of that, he was obsessed with helping Jews at that time. So I read that Toscanini had a biographer who was writing his biography. And he phones him one night and he says, Arturo, can I come visit you tonight? Toscanini says, I'm busy. He says, why are you busy? He says, I used to have overseas, before he moved to America, I had a symphony that I was the conductor. I gave it over to somebody else. And tonight, he's conducting the symphony. I want to hear what it sounds like. So I arranged through shortwave radio to be able to hear the symphony. Then shortwave radio was a big chiddush to hear a symphony from overseas. So the biographer says, ah, says, a metzia, can I come watch you listen to your own symphony? He says, yes, if you don't say a word. So the biographer comes and he watches Toscanini listening to his symphony through the shortwave radio signals. When he finishes, the biographer says, Maestro, that was brilliant, no? Toscanini says, nah, not really. What was the problem? He said, there were supposed to be 15 violins, there were only 14 violins. He thought the guy's off his rock. You heard a symphony through the radio, hundreds of instruments, and you know there was one violinist missing? I'm a sugar nut. The next day, he phones the conductor overseas, and he says, I have to ask you a question. How many musicians were yesterday at the symphony? He says, you know, we were supposed to have 15 violinists, only 14 showed up. He goes back to Toscanini. He says, how in the world, sitting on a couch, thousands of miles away, listening to a concerto on the radio, can you detect that one violin was missing? Toscanini looked at him and says, that's the difference between you and me. You're part of the audience. I am the conductor. I know each note. I created these notes. As a composer too. From your perspective, a note here, a note there doesn't make a difference. From my perspective, I knew that this symphony needs, needs 15 violins. And the moment I heard that some notes were not met, I knew that a violin, a violin was missing. And I thought to myself, what a metaphor for life. From our perspective, the audience's perspective, a note is lost, is not played. We don't feel the loss. From the Reboi Nishaloylam's perspective, every child is an indispensable note in that symphony. And if his or her violin is not playing, as Rabbi Yehuda Halevi says, Ani kinor l'shirayich, many years before your Shalayim Shal Zahav. Ani kinor l'shirayich, I am a harp for your melodies. Every Yiddish kind is a kinor l'shirayich. And if that kinor is not being played fully, there's something about the whole song, about the whole symphony, about the whole ballad that's flawed. So the other day, the other day, a few years ago, there was a conductor giving a speech by a TED, by one of those TED conferences. And he said that he once spoke to a Holocaust survivor, a woman, who told him something that changed his life. She and her eight-year-old brother were placed on a train transported to the death camp of Auschwitz. Their parents were already gone, so it was her, 15 years old, and her eight-year-old brother. 
They're on the train on the way to Auschwitz. And at some point, she takes a look at her baby brother, and she sees he doesn't have his shoes. She says, where are your shoes? He says, in the commotion of the Germans chasing them onto the train, he lost his shoes. She got really annoyed with her brother, like an older sister gets annoyed with her baby brother. And she starts saying, you're such an idiot. You're such a schlamazel. You can't get your life together. Tati and mommy are not here. Where am I going to get you another pair of shoes? I can't believe you're such a this, you're such a that. You know, an older sister could give it to her younger brother when she's in a bad mood, especially if she feels responsible. Where am I going to get you a pair of shoes? I can't believe you did this. And she screamed at him and hollered at him and insulted him and denigrated him. And she turns to this conductor, I think Zandman, and she says to him, and I want to tell you, that conversation was the last conversation I ever had with my brother. Soon we arrived to the death camp. Mengele made the selection. He went in one direction, I went in another direction. A few hours later, his body was burnt in the crematoriums. And that was the last time I saw and spoke to my brother. And I could never forgive myself that my last conversation with my brother, moments before his brutal death, was insulting him. What an idiot he is, how foolish he is, what a moron he is, how irresponsible he is. I could never forgive myself. She says, the day of liberation came. I stepped out of those cursed portals. Arbit macht frei. And I stepped into freedom. And as I stepped into freedom, I decided that I'm going to live a life of freedom. And I'm going to live a life of happiness. And I'm going to embrace life with all my emotion and with all my zest and with all my passion and with all my emotion. And then I made one more resolution to myself. I said to myself, from now on, Whenever I speak to somebody, especially whenever I speak to a child, I'm going to speak in a way that later I will not regret if I find out that that was my last conversation with this person. That was my resolution in life. Now, I know that's pretty intense. That's pretty loaded. But it gives perspective. It gives perspective what a conversation is, what words are. Can I say I am wholesome with the fact that this was the last conversation. You know why? Because I was present, because I was real, because I was authentic, because I was kind, because I was in a moment of dvekus when I spoke. I wasn't in a moment of vengeance, resentment, anger, coldness, and apathy. I was there. In the words of Avram, Vayoyim Eloi Avi, Vayoymer, He nay me. Legadil looks at every child and says, this child will be treated in this school. This child will be taken care of in this school with that dignity that for their whole life they will know that when they called out and said, Avi, my father, or Imi, my mother, consciously or unconsciously, our response was, he, nay, ni. Thank you very much.